steam power brought about a revolution in transport. It was one of Britain's greatest contributions to the industrial world. In the age of steam, the railways moved everything and everybody. They changed society forever. My interest in railways started at a very early age. I was born in a, in a collection of terraced houses, somewhat similar to Coronation Street, all clustered together. And as a little lad from the back bedroom window, I could look down an alleyway and see the signal box on the main line from Manchester through Bolton. On a moonlit night, you, know, you could hear the whistle blowing as it were approaching Bolton. And it would bash across the end of this ginnel with the fire old door open and you could see two characters on the footplate crouched in position. Oh, that's really what inspired me and got me interested in steam engines. Then I got really lucky sat on the end of the platform at night with a penny platform ticket in the pouring rain and the guy had come in with a locomotive and stopped it dead level with me at the end of the platform. Have a quick look up and down, see if there were anybody of any authority about and then give me a wave to run and jump on the engine and then we went 20 miles through the night. It was quite exciting. That would have been around 1950, a time when locomotive engineering was at its peak. Here at the Bluebell Line in East Sussex, they have the largest collection of ex-Southern region locomotives in the country. The very last steam locos were withdrawn from British Rail Services in 1968. But here you can still see them steaming away. This one is a bullied Light Pacific Blackmore Vale and was built in 1946. The reason for its name, Bullied, is it's actually named after its creator, Oliver Vaughan Snell Bullied. He introduced a lot of new things like electric welding on his locomotive building to keep the weight down and of course put this beautiful characteristic streamlining on to cut the air resistance down. Blackmore Vale was one of the last Bullied Pacifics to run on British Rail. Right, Steve, it's like the ultimate, this, isn't it, in uh, the refinement, you know. I, I know that Mr Bully did a lot of welding and all of that, but what else is there, you know? There's, I've noticed there's some other fancy bits. Well, they kind of made things easier for the crew. Yeah. For example, yeah. the steam-operated doors, which on the main line, when you're kind of doing 80, 90 mile an hour, yeah, yeah. Mm. a great boost, because yeah, there's a very oh, yeah. big draw on the yeah, fire. Yeah, so yeah. if you can open and shut the doors quickly, it mm. helps keep the... Uh, the heating. The heating. Mm -hmm. the other thing was electric lighting to light up things like the yeah. gauge here so we see where the water level is in the boiler yeah. see where the reverser is yeah, when it's dark I'm just looking at that these were done kind of 18 90 mile an hour yeah, shifting, on, on the main line but here on this preserved railway we're only allowed to do 25 probably yeah. 25 mile an hour it's just feel as though they have to take off and you've yeah, got to start holding yeah. them back yeah. <laughs> very frustrating yes <laughs> Anybody who's never had a ride on a locomotive going fast has never lived. The Pacifics were like the supreme end to the, the steam engine. I remind you of when steam engines were king of all the rails and the British rail were the envy of the world. Basically, under all the fancy green paint and the, the lagging, there's one of these, you know, the locomotive boiler. When it comes into the station and you look at it, there's the cab, of course, with the two windows in each corner, and, and near to them is this, is this big square bit, you know, sticking out. And then the boiler barrel, this is the round bit, goes along to the funnel end, and this bit here is called the firebox. And, of course, all these are screwed stays that go through this outer plate here, through two and a half inches of water and through the firebox proper which is on the inside and of course if these stairs weren't here when you got the pressure up to 150 pounds per square inch it would soon end up like a great beer barrel so it's going to have all these stairs which are very important and round the back this of course is if we were if we were steaming along the railway on the railway now the footplate would be about here and of course much wider maybe six feet wide or seven feet wide and there's against this two foot wide and then of course you you know you open the door and and fling in the wood 
And right at the far end, you can see all the tunes, which of course Stevenson's rocket were the first locomotive to have it like this. All them tubes go through from the firebox to the smoke box at the other end, you know. And, and, and of course the products of combustion and the heat goes through all them tubes, boiling the water a lot faster than great single fluid boilers, you know, like the early locomotives that they made. And it's time we put some more wood on to get the water boiling. Right, here we go. Locomotive engineering reached its peak between the 1930s and the 1950s. It was the time when the great passenger express locals were built. But the earliest railways were very primitive affairs, basically just horse-drawn wagonways. And the early history is quite checkered and confusing. The very first railways were developed and get coal from the collieries down to rivers and the sea. And of course this here is the Tanfield Wagonway or Light Railway, which shows us a lot really of how early railways were developed. Opened in 1725, it's reputed to be one of the oldest in the world. When it first started, it was actually horse drawn. In the 18th century, it was the biggest thing that moved coal in all of England, you know, possibly all the world. This wagon here is a, isn't an original one, it's a replica of the type of wagon that we used on here with wooden rails and of course you can see even wooden wheels. It's basically all wood apart from a few iron spikes. Wooden rails and wooden wheels had lots of disadvantages. They'd only lasted about 12 months before the rails were actually worn away and they had great trouble with the track setting on fire when they break the, uh, the wagons. They come up with some rather ingenious gimmicks though, like they did an actual double row of, of wooden track. So as the top length of it wore away, they could take sections out and put it back in without disturbing the sleepers. And this lasted right up until the 1830s when the actual track were replaced by metal. By this time, the first steam-powered locals designed to run on metal tracks had appeared on the scene. And the pioneer, as with so many things associated with steam, was the great Cornish engineer Richard Trevithick. Trevithick's first steam locals were built to run on the roads. The state of the roads was so bad he decided to have a go at one to run on rails. In 1804, he was asked to build a small locomotive for a South Wales mining and iron company, which he called the Penny Darren. And this is it, this is a replica of it. And it was actually the first real steam locomotive that actually worked for a living. And it's rather a ponderous thing, as you can see. The Penny Darren actually pulled a load of 10 tonnes of iron ore and 70 men for a distance of some 10 miles at 5 miles an hour. It won Richard Trevithick a prize of £500 for being the first man in the world to build a successful locomotive. Penny Darren was the first attempt to adapt the steam engine to work on the railroad but there were a lot of problems with it. The main one was getting sufficient grip for smooth wheels to run along a smooth track. Trevithick abandoned his experiments, but other engineers worked away at the idea. And in the early 1800s, one place led the world. It's Northumbria you've got to come to to discover the early days of the railways. Here, on the Pockley Wagonway in the Beamish Altner Museum, recreating what the railways of the period actually looked like. Inside this shed, there's a collection of locomotives from the very earliest days of the railways. This magnificent locomotive is a full-sized working replica. It's so old, it's got a wooden chassis, and it's called the Steam Elephant. And when you study it, like you look at the funnel, it's almost like it obviously where it got its name from, you know, it's just like an elephant's trunk. Originally built in 1815 by Chapman and Buddle for the Walls End Colliery, and it worked from 1815 to 1840, and then it mysteriously disappeared. 
These early locos, like the steam elephant, were all built for the coal mines in the northeast. And it was in these mines that the most famous man in railway history worked. When he was a young man, Stevenson was engine right at Killingworth Pit, so he would have been familiar with locos like the steam elephant. Stevenson wasn't the inventor of the locomotive, but he played a leading part in turning it into a practical means of hauling coal and transporting passengers over long distances. It was the beginning of the railways as we know them. Many people think railway history started in September 1825 when George Stevenson's Locomotion No. 1 pulled a train of 38 wagons from Shildon to Darlington and then on to Stockton and the whole train weighed 90 tonnes and it went at the unbelievable speed of 12 miles an hour. It had two cylinders which drove cross beams and connecting rods. The driver, his position is stood on the side on a plank which is rather peculiar, so he works all the levers on the valve gear and puts the steam into the cylinders. On the first run, George Stevenson actually drove the locomotive and his brothers acted as firemen. You know, it must have been quite exciting, really, and like being an airline pilot in 1825. <laughs> Incredible. To have no brake, like to stop the thing, the firemen had to actually jump off and pin down the brakes on the on the coal wagon. Quite an early occupation. Yeah, the unbelievable speed of 12 miles an hour. After the success of the Stockton and Darlington line, Stevenson landed the job of principal constructing engineer for a new line between Liverpool and Manchester. As it neared completion, they had to sort out what sort of motive power was to be used for the line. Some of the directors wanted horses and some thought stationary engines would be better. Stevenson was about the only one who backed the local and he managed to persuade the directors to all the competition which became known as the Rain Hill Trials to decide on the best design. Rocket entered by George Stevenson and his son Robert was the most successful machine there. It outperformed the other competitors with a top speed of 24 miles an hour. Here at the National Railway Museum, they've got a cutaway replica of Rocket that shows the innovations that made it so successful. Stevenson went way off track and came up with a brand new revolutionary design, which of course incorporated the fire tube boiler and which really is, is the prototype for all modern locomotive boilers that we know today. The thing is, in relation to its weight and the power it had, you know, it went much faster than any other locomotive that had been built before. You know, it did away with all the beams and the levers of the earlier locomotives. This, at the time, was a revolutionary boiler. It had never been done before. The fact that the actual shell had 25 copper tubes going from one end to the other and the way to transfer the heat from the fire into these tubes was this creation here, which of course was the beginnings of the true firebox. It would have worked much better than just a single fire tube into the boiler of the earlier models. The other wonderful thing were the blast pipe, which of course, when the piston had gone up and down and turned the wheels round, the, the escaping steam from the valve chest went along that copper pipe and into the base of the funnel where of course it created a vacuum in the bottom which drew the fire with an unbelievable degree of violence. The other wonderful thing were the connecting rod which of course connected the piston rod directly to the crank pin on the hub of the front wheels which of course led to nice smooth running and wooden front wheels and springs. A lot of the earlier engines didn't have any springs in a rather clever way so the front axle can oscillate and rock about. The actual crank pins are like as big as a tennis ball. Inside there, instead of it being parallel, it's a round steel ball on the end of the crank pin and the brasses are hollowed out like an internal sphere. So wherever in relation to the piston rod were, the connecting rod, the, the thing would never bind up, as you might say. The brilliant idea of using 
many tubes in the boiler instead of one big one or two big ones were a good idea that Stevenson didn't invent. A, a man called Booth did a bit of a drawing, you know, back of a fag packet and, uh, or a bit of paper similar size. And, uh, of course, Mr Stevenson were very good at weighing up what were the best on the market and if it hadn't been patented, using it himself. And, of course, it turned out really successful. The rocket ran for quite a few years after its initial trials at Rain Hill, but the cylinders were too high up. So the whole thing was top heavy, you know, when, when you opened it up, it, it used to rock about. But the rocket really is, without a shadow of a doubt, the forerunner of the modern steam locomotive as we know it today. Alongside Rocket, they've got another of the competitors, built by Timothy Ackworth, who was locomotive superintendent on the Stockton and Darlington Railway. Timothy Ackworth built the Sanspareil to enter in the Rain Hill trials, and it were really Stevenson's only real rival. The Sanspareil were quite old technology for the time. It, it had the usual shell with the U-shaped flue in it, and it had one or two other oddities. The, the driver were at one end and the, and the fireman were at the other. After a promising start, disaster struck. One of the cylinders split from top to bottom, and of course the water pump failed, and they nearly run out of water, which would might have caused an explosion. But it must have been very difficult for Ackworth to build a locomotive, because he didn't even have a workshop. He'd got to get all the parts manufactured outside by independent contractors. And the main parts, the cylinders, were actually done by his rival, George Stevenson. And of course, he was rather bitter because the, the word sabotage come into it at the end ruined his chances of winning the Rain Hill trials. I don't really think it could have ever won because the rocket really is the engine that were far superior with its fire tube boiler, much better steamer altogether. The immediate success with Stevenson's rocket finally established what motive power were going to be used on the Liverpool to Manchester Railway, and it was immediately equipped with locomotives. Stevenson got the contract to build them the work was done by his son Robert at his 4th Street Locomotive Works in Newcastle, which soon became the leading locomotive manufacturer in the world. By 1830, around 100 locomotives had been built in Britain. Stevenson introduced the Planet class for work on the Liverpool and Manchester. But other railways had different ideas. The steam locomotive didn't take over overnight. Even after the success of the Stockton and Darlington and the Liverpool to Manchester Railway, there were still other forms of railways being built. It was a combination of old horsepower and new horsepower, and it seems a bit of a convoluted and hodgepodge method to do things, but it must have worked because that's what they had here at the Cromford and High Peak Railway in Derbyshire. When the entrepreneurs wanted to build a canal from the Cromford Canal to the High Peak Canal, it proved to be far too expensive to cut and build locks over these great hills. So they settled for a system of inclined planes and flat parts. Now on the flat parts, horses were the motive power. But on the inclined planes, they had double-acting winding drums and engine houses. A wire hauser went round this wheel and it went all the way down the to the bottom of the hill and round another wheel. It was sort of, in a way, an endless raw haulage system. The full ones came up the hill, so I would think there'd be 10 tonnes of limestone in them, and the empty ones came down as a sort of counterbalance. Originally, there were nine of these winding engine houses, and this is the only one left, and it actually still works. This is it, this is the winding engine at the top of the incline. Built in 1829 by the Butterley Iron Company just down the road. Basically, it's two single cylinder steam engines joined together by a common crankshaft. As you can see behind me, the flywheel in the middle, and of course the rope drums 
disappearing with the rope out through the wall. In the days of like low, fairly low pressures, they needed more pressure. It was quite common to build two engines and place them side by side like this one. Rope haulage railways like this were quite common and they continued to be built well into the 19th century, mainly to pull coal. This is the Bowes Railway near Gateshead, which continued to operate right up until 1974. But this sort of thing never really took off for passenger railways. And as the railway network spread across the country, it was the locomotive that won the day. Between 1830 and the end of the century, massive progress was made in locomotive design. This one at the National Railway Museum is based on a design that Robert Stevenson first came up with in the 1830s. It's amazing what progress was made in such a short time. And back here on the Bluebell line, they've got a couple of engines in steam that go back to those early days. By the 1870s, the size of London was exploding and they needed reliable little locomotives for what we now know as commuting services. Penchurch was one of the locals designed for the job. That was alright, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> this locomotive behind me, Penchurch, is what's known as a tarrier, which of course were like a very small locomotive and very popular in the southern counties and on the rural little lines. Designed by Mr. Stroudley in the 1870s and they made quite a lot. There's a lot of nice interesting bits on it, like the exhaust can be converted from going up the funnel or diverting into the, into the water tanks, which of course preheats the water and saves a bit of water that would normally condense in the atmosphere. I mean, considering it was made in 1872 and it's still here, it's quite a credit to Mr. Stroudley. But the development of the railways wasn't straightforward, especially when the great engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel was involved. While Britain's railway network had developed with a four foot eight and a half inch gauge, Brunel's Great Western Railway was built with a completely different seven foot and a quarter inch gauge. When Brunel got the idea for his railway, he already thought that George Stevenson and his son, their railway at four foot eight and a half were far too narrow. And that's why he sent, settled on seven foot wide like this, you see. And of course, Already, half of England were, were covered with four foot eight and a half railways, and it didn't seem to dawn on him that it'd be a bit awkward. He rather thought that there wouldn't be much trouble, you know, getting off a train that only had four foot eight and a half, and then getting on another one that was seven foot wide. For a time, they had both systems, the four foot eight and a half and the seven foot gauge running together. But as you can see in this little bit here, it must have got very complicated when they come to a junction or a crossover. Now, if you get to the outside of a great railway station, what's well, just got four foot eight and a half. Outside Paddington with both sets must have been an unbelievably complicated affair, which I think really is the reason that they did away with Mr. Brunel's extra line on the outside. Uh, a bit of a shame, really, because I think if the had still been seven foot wide, It'd have been a lot smoother and maybe a lot faster and uh, and everything, but Mr. Stevenson won with his four foot eight and a half. The sad thing is that in the 1890s they did completely away with the broad gauge. All the locomotives that couldn't be converted to four foot eight and a half were all given the chop. So, there are no original Great Western broad gauge locomotives around today. See what they were like, replicas have had to be built. This is Iron Duke, which I had a ride on when I was at the National Railway Museum. And here at the Didcot Railway Centre, they are constructing a replica of a broad gauge Firefly class locomotive. 
They've got the frames, the cylinders, the, the cranks, the wheels and everything, or the frame and the running gear. Now the boiler's been tested and all they've got to do is get the boiler into the frames and connect it all up and then they can go for a little ride outside on a, on a section of seven foot gauge track that they've built. In spite of losing the battle of the gauges, the Great Western Railway went from strength to strength and in 1902 they appointed George Jackson Churchward as the locomotive superintendent and he produced a range of designs which were far ahead of the time and very successful. The work that was begun by Churchward was continued by C.B. Collett who took over from him in 1922. His kings and castles have become a benchmark in the design of passenger locomotives and by the 1930s the Great Western Railway's engines were amongst the most famous in the land. Here at the Didcot Railway Centre you get the feeling of what steam locomotion was like on the Great Western Railway. Turn of speed this time. <laughs> yes, sir. So basically, we're maximum we can do is 25 miles an hour, yeah. but it's quite uh, yeah. straightforward and comfortable. Yeah. What were the big improvements on these particular things? Well, there's well, a large, larger boiler, and also they had as a four-cylinder yeah. arrangement. There's yeah. two sets of motion to drive each pair of cylinders. Yeah, but Brad somewhere they they've got to get from London to Bristol a, a mile a minute sort of thing. Yes, that's one of the requirements, and yeah. uh, they certainly uh, achieved that. And they could yeah. go faster, but uh, I think uh, with 100 miles an hour was a little bit pushing them. Yeah. How many have survived of this particular class? So about eight, I believe. There was originally about uh, 171. What lines did these run on? The Great Western lines radiated from Paddington, yeah. so they used to use them to go in the West Country to Bristol on the more direct line through yeah. West yeah. Plymouth, yeah. and uh, also on the lines to South Wales and up to Birmingham. By the 1930s, when this was built, the steam locomotive had come a long way from the first primitive efforts they'd been making just over a hundred years earlier. Between 1804 and 1971, Britain built an incredible 110,000 steam locomotives. Without a doubt, the development of the railways have been one of the greatest technical developments in British history. from steam trains to the Channel Tunnel next on BBC Two, Alan Titchmarsh reveals how you can walk to France in a natural history of the British Isles. <laughs> 